Hello, everybody. Good to see y'all. It's very different from Zoom. I couldn't find the microphone. <laughs> I know. I know. It is different from Zoom. I'm. I'm. I still have a lot to learn about these meetings too. So, I have no end of appreciation for what good sports everybody is for showing up, especially with this new technology that the county decided we were going to switch to. <laughs> Yay! The other was too easy. Yeah. Right. We all just had the <laughs> hang of the other one. So let's let's grow. Let's continue to challenge ourselves and just that's how I'm going to handle it. <laughs> it seem and also we do seem we have worked out some of the kinks. We were having some issues with people getting locked in the waiting room. Um, and I couldn't see that they were there, so they weren't getting access to the meeting. So we, uh, Ruby went through and edited all the invites or all the meeting schedules to take that out. And so that's why you didn't encounter a waiting room when you uh, when you were joining today. You just came right in. Okay. This is good. Thanks for everybody who has joined us so far. We're going to get started just to respect everybody's time. Make sure we start on time. We have a couple, few things to do today. We're going to discuss the survey results for the second survey of, for the community, as well as um, talk about setting an in-person meeting that's going to be just Lakeport specific. So this is a different one from the press release that you would have seen with the all LAPAX um, in-person meetings that are this Thursday and on Monday. And um, that's where all LAPACs are going to get together to talk about the, the planning area boundaries. So that was changing the planning area in some areas for um, that may affect Lakeport or Kelseyville or Upper Lake. So um, we thought it would be best to get all LAPACs together so we could so the Kelseyville people could talk to the Upper Lake people or the, the Lakeport people, you know, um, on any of those potential boundary changes. Then let's see. Also, we have um, Dr. Bob Gardner here with us today. And so we want I want to make sure that we touch on one of our agenda items, which is talking about land use designation amendments. Now, requests to change these land use um, designations, which would change, you know, what you could do with your land from what is existing to what is proposed. Um, those proposals could come from staff or from property owners or from LAPAC themselves or any member of the public. And so what we have today um, with um, Bob is a property owner um, based request. So I'll let him talk about that. And um, when he is talking about it, I'll pull it up on the GIS system so y'all could see um, and share screen so you can see what he's talking about. And then if recommendations, um, if the LAPAC is comfortable doing recommendations today, we're capturing that on video because all of our all of these meetings are recorded. Um, Additionally, we could discuss it further in that LAPAC specific in-person meeting where we're, we're all going to be looking at the same uh, large paper map too. So uh, let's see. So let's start with the second survey. Um, if you didn't have it handy in front of you, you can access it, access it at the Lake County 2050 um, website. They're all up there in the uh, documents tab. So very similar to all of the uh, all of the surveys, the demographics were actually pretty much the same no matter where you went or, or which planning area. Most of uh, most of the participants um, and there were 51. That's a pretty good showing for Lake Pat uh, for this planning area. 51 surveys turned in, uh, but mostly from older residents. So 50 years and older and mostly white. Um, so what that just tells me as far as staff goes is that it's really good that we're planning uh, some events that will reach out to um, the, the people who are maybe under 50 so um, or not white. We do have a Spanish stakeholders meeting scheduled for this 
Wednesday, I think, at St. Mary's Church in Lakeport. And we're serving pizza. So hopefully we'll get a large um, response from a demographic that we have had trouble reaching so far. And then we're also in talks to uh, to reach out to the tribes and visit them, you know, in whatever arena makes them comfortable to make sure that we're getting tribal input as well. So that's ongoing. Um, there was a boundary map change that we can save until we're all looking at the same large map. We do. We did create planning area specific um, maps, and those are also posted on the Lake County 2050.org website. And that those include the potential planning boundary area changes, as well as the existing commun um, land use designations. So you can see what uses are, are currently possible, uh, as well as community growth boundaries, which is where we center and focus our um, our public infrastructure, the water and sewer, as well as, excuse me, where we anticipate future um, higher density housing as well as commercial growth. One of the tasks before each LAPAC is to talk about whether they want to change those community growth boundaries um, and if there are areas of focus growth that we'd like to see in the future. And so we'll talk about that when we're all looking at the map as well. Um, it'll also have roads on there for context, uh, and I think that's about it. So anyway, you can get that map um, on the Lake County 2050 website, and those are the maps that we're going to print out like in the table size, the larger formats for our in-person meetings. Additionally, yeah, yeah, uh, go ahead, Danny. And, and anybody can jump is... in at any time. So, oh, yeah. thank you. Uh, just where what's the name of that document or where is it under in the 2050 let me take a look let's share i'll share my site and we'll find it together thank you uh, yeah certainly good question let's see ecads okay minimize the screen so i can get to it county2050.org let's go to documents that's where i would look first um, community engagement documents, I know. Oh, there you go. There's the land use maps right there under community engagement. And then also, if you scroll down further, there's the results to the second survey. I did get that. Thank you. Super. All right. Um, a couple other things that I thought that that were consistent with the different surveys is um, is the questions about mixed use development. So that's combining residential uh, possibilities or options within the commercial zoned areas. And uh, there was a strong support for that in our Lakeport uh, surveys, as well as diversification of agriculture. The, this question about diversified uses um, in ag came from staff, and it's in response to a number of inquiries that I've received over the years for um, microbreweries most recently um, at winery areas, as well as uh, distillery options for wine products. Um, the wine industry, because of the struggles that they're having right now, uh, industry-wide, they're looking for or different diversification uses. And so that was originally the purpose of getting that question in the survey. However, one of the results that um, that surprised me was one of the options for if you say yes, what kind of uses would you like to see? And in Lakeport, as uh, consistently with all the lay packs, the number one answer wasn't what I was expecting, but it was um, it was youth agriculture and wilderness education. And so I just thought that part was really interesting as well as we go through um, talking about our local area plans and priorities. It'll be interesting to see how we capture that uh, for future projects. Because just to refresh everybody, the, the purpose of a local area plan is to communicate the, the community's priorities and visions for the next 10, who knows, 10 to 20 years. We don't update these very often uh, because it's very time intensive, staff resource intensive and expensive. So this is the community's vision for the next 10 to 20 years. Uh, and it, it then informs the countywide or or complete 
overhaul of the zoning ordinance, which is the document that's sort of the mechanics. It's the regulations that roll out the community visions in the general plan and local area plans. And so it'll be fun to see um, see that how we're going to reflect that in the future, since I, I already see some of it going on in the community now, like the wilderness education with uh, groups like Tara um, and other groups that are looking to do more outreach and education on uh, vegetation management on properties that is that that helps to maintain and support a healthy ecosystem. Um, Mary Jo, you could probably speak to anything that you've seen in the community already as far as supporting uh, wilderness education. Um, well, we, we're, we're doing our best. I, I'm on the board of directors for both the Land Trust and the Resource Conservation District. So it's a lot of different angles. Um, and we're getting a really good response. I think there's a lot of enthusiasm in the community for, um, we're, we're talking on um, one of the preserves, actually two of the preserves are talking about having Terra do cultural burns uh, as, as a demonstration project, um, because cool. I think it's, people are scared of fire and if they can see that it can be a, a low burn can be beneficial see the benefits of it that there'll be more public enthusiasm for it great excellent thank you um let's see what else so to talk about uh, the next questions in eight and nine, we're talking about neighborhoods that aren't well represented, to, well, well represented in the area plan. And then following up with the, um, are there any communities or neighborhoods that require localized policy guidance? These are questions that we're getting to the, do you think we have any areas of special study needs? And that's where we focus on a portion of the planning area, a community uh, within the planning area that could use could benefit from um, policy or design guidelines. So it, it, I didn't see, well, it did say that there were communities that were not well represented, um, which sometimes doesn't necessarily answer the question of special study area, but rather tells us that there are communities that might feel disenfranchised um, or not, not really included in that planning area. Um, I was wondering about uh, these results because some of the write-in ones uh, were Scotts Valley, North Lakeport, Lafferty Road. There's a grow house with 185 marijuana plants. Well, that's actually a code enforcement complaint that I will uh, forward to staff. Um, but Reeves Lane and Whalen Way, we don't usually do a single road special study area. Um, so kind of what that the, those write-ins were telling me is that um, people are a little disconnected from uh, feeling from from the area plan, understanding what it is, what its purpose is, and uh, and are their neighborhoods included, and especially the the right in area with Reeves Road, because one of the possibilities for changing our planning area boundaries included, I think, includes Reeves Road, um, moving it into the Kelseyville area. So, but I was wondering if the LAPAC had any thoughts about these two questions about um, community inclusion or if there's a need for special policy and design uh, development for a particular um, sub community of the Lakeport area. I, I do think that Whalen Way, I think the roads that do shoot off, they're kind of out by the like water processing facility, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. I think that is one area that is probably, you know, is technically represented in that upper lake and maybe shoreline community. But it, as far as its physical connections go, it's, it's, you have to go through Lakeport and, you know, under the bridge or in, in the general area around um, like the jail and um, all that area. So I think just that little sort of corner maybe could have been something that was asked about similar like the airport or the the eastern out along soda bay something similar to that but um of course without asking specifically those people that live there i wouldn't say for certain obviously 
Right. Hey, Betsy, I think we can hear you typing. I'm sorry? I think we can hear you typing. Oh, You're, I'm so uh, sorry. I do that all the time. <laughs> Um, That's okay. I, have three, I have three comments I'd like to um, add here, please. First of all, uh, I wrote a list of um, recommendations for the area plan. I sent it to those members of the advisory committee whose names and addresses I have, but I don't have them. Uh, I do have uh, Paul Duncan, of course, but I don't have Dr. Gardner's uh, email address. I'd like to send mm-hmm. them to him. Um, uh, and Mary Jo, I didn't realize you were going to be here, so I'll send that to you as well. Uh, the, the the most important thing I, I think has to be understood is that the plan as it exists right now consists only of special study areas. Um, I think it's really important to create a map including the city, even if the city isn't the governing entity, because the special study areas receive all of their essential services from the city and the city has 20 year long general plan approved expansion gradual expansion areas into the margins of those special study areas and we're not looking at that we're not looking at the whole area so then when you say if there's a special study area that's needed in one of the special study areas for a smaller subset of marginalized or disenfranchised people I mean, that's confusing to me because the whole thing is a special study area. Third, I would like to say that there are needs for farm worker housing, which have been identified for a long time, mobile home parks, which are regulated by the state for emergency management purposes and that have uh, large numbers of older disabled uh, residents. And then those those um, uh, logical a changes where, let's say Reeves Road should be moved into the Kelseyville area. Well, that's you know that's that's a uh, Reeves Road. I believe their sewer is uh, served by the city of Lakeport. So, so how do you you know what good is it going to do that population to be included in the Kelseyville plan? I'm not sure. Um, and then of course we have the whole new. Um, a big Valley Community Advisory Council has its set of priorities. And then the strange uh, um, question about whether the airport should be included in uh, with the two. Um, you, you know, it's obviously an extension of the commercial zone, commercial light industry. It is designated for the area of heavy industry in the county. They're on the airport grounds. Uh, and what entity will govern that? Um, it's, it's clearly going to be the county for permitting. Uh, does the Kelseyville community really want to, you know, expand into, uh, you know, manufacturing and, and, and uh, you know, it's not just kind of antithetical to the whole uh, Kelseyville uh, community. So those comments, thank you very much. Thank you. Also, I wanted, um, Margo also sent in uh, some emails. And so I just wanted you both to know that um, I forwarded those also to the Lake County 2050 email address just to make sure that we don't lose track of them. So thank you for taking the time to do that. Um, I just realized that I forgot to do introductions so that we all know who each other are. Um, I'll start with me and then I'll call out the tiles that that I can see. Um, I'm Maria Turner, Director of Community Development for Lake County and main staff support for LAPAX. Um, Margo, I see your name. Do you want to let people know um, and if you're on which LAPAC and or GPAC because we had a number of GPAC members here today. Hello, everybody. Thank you, Maria. Yes, I'm a Margo Kambara. I'm a GPAC member, the General Plan Advisory Committee. I represent District 4. Thank you. Thanks. Um, Bob? Hi, everybody. I'm Bob Gardner, and I'm part of the general public. I had a specific uh, request for a parcel in the LAPAC area. Thanks. Paul, go ahead. 
uh, Paul Duncan. I'm the operations chief for the um, Sonoma Lake Napa unit of CAL FIRE. Um, I'm the division chief responsible for Lake County and part of the GPAC uh, yeah. group. And I attend these meetings just for information and for trying to get uh, everybody's feelings. So that's it. Mary Jo, go ahead. And Greg, I'm working to see if I can unmute you, not on this side. So Greg just sent a chat on how to unmute. Let's see if I have any. No, but if you look at the the bars at the top, I think is the top is most often where I see it. You'll see a, a camera icon and a microphone icon. Click on that. There you are. Okay, we're getting it. We're learning teams. Awesome. Mary Jo, did you did you introduce yourself? I got distracted. No, no. <laughs> um, uh, Mary Jo Velasquez, I am part of the general public. And I, I have a question. Reeves Road is Reeves Lane? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Because I was trying Thanks. to the map, I was trying to find Reeves Road. <laughs> awesome. Go ahead, Danny, you're next. Hi, I'm Danny Wind. I'm on the lay pack for Lakeport. Um, I currently live in the city of Lakeport, but I've also lived in North Lakeport and have been working in North Lakeport. So um, very well based in Lakeport. <laughs> awesome. Angela, go ahead. Thank you, Maria. I'm still trying to figure out this whole Teams thing. So, um, Angela Amaral, member of the public, also on the lay pack for the Shoreline Area Plan, but mostly here to troubleshoot Teams and make sure it's working before our next meeting. <laughs> Thank you. Good thinking. Thanks for doing that. Greg. Yes, uh, Greg Scott, Chairman of the Scotts Valley uh, Advisory, uh, Community Advisory uh, Council, live in Scotts Valley and a former Cal Fire Division Chief retired in 2000. Some people are still working, some aren't. Also, Jarrett, who is also a member, is trying to get on. I've been trying to talk him how to get on into Teams here. I don't know if he's had luck that, that says in chat. He was invited, and I'm trying to get him in, but his computer's having problems. I see Jarrett in. He just joined and somebody else joined unverified that had some weird picture. So I just kicked them out. Um, Betsy, go ahead. Hi. Yeah. So Betsy Kahn, I'm the uh, uh, sole proprietor editor in chief of the essential public information center, a reporter for KPFZ. I have property in Scotts Valley. I have been a, a Longtime supporter of the agricultural community out there. I'm a member of the General Plan Advisory Committee and the Upper Lake Meese Advisory Committee. Thank you. Super. Jared, welcome. Thanks for coming. Go ahead and introduce yourself to the group, please. And if you're wondering how to unmute, there's a microphone icon, I think, at the top bar of your picture. That you can click there you go but we can't hear you well to help out let me introduce jared he's a long time resident on hendricks road he does a lot of research on the area here has a lot of records of history and control burning and focusing work of blm in the local area He's also a, the vice chair of the Scotts Valley Community Advisory Committee. Excellent. Thank you. So, again, just to recap, the members for LAPAC that we currently have, only three have been appointed by the board. So that's Danny and Greg and Jared. If you have any interest in serving on a LAPAC, we have room for nine um, members. So feel free to, uh, to contact the administrative office and send in an application and we'll get you on a board agenda. But you are totally welcome to participate just as a member of the public. You do not have to be appointed. Uh, and we have, just as an overview, we have about a month. We have till middle of November to um, to have our, hold our LAPAC meetings to seek consensus on a number of topics that I refer to as our deliverables to the 
uh, Lake County 2050 core team that we will then use to, um, to when, as we're drafting the local area plans. And those drafts, I think we expect to be out like at the end of December or beginning of January. So we're meeting um, in LAPAC. We're having LAPAC meetings for the next three to four weeks. Um, to make sure that it will be a combination of virtual as well as in-person meetings to make sure that we have vetted through the ideas, topics, and key issues um, uh, with enough time so that when we do get to the draft area plans, it is reflective of the community's vision. So we were going through the second survey. Oh, and please, there are only nine of us. You don't have to raise your hand. Just go ahead and speak out. Except when you're muted, you might want right. to. There you go. So, um, yeah, Teams is different. But anyway, today we're meeting at one o'clock. It uh, seems like a pretty good time. Everybody's here. I'd like to say that uh, to save time, maybe this Monday for every Monday at one o'clock to two thirty, whatever it is, would be a, a good standard meeting time that we can calendar and follow through on. I don't know. Just a suggestion. Thank you, Greg. That is perfect because it gives me the opportunity to remind our LAPAC members that I did send out a doodle poll, I think last Friday, um, that had pretty much every open spot that I have in my calendar through the middle of November. And it also included a number of evening meetings. We had a suggestion from the public that said, you know, maybe more public members could participate if the meetings weren't all during working hours. And so I did identify a number of evening hours as well as um, Saturdays and Sundays to see if, uh, if, it, if we might schedule a, a LAPAC meeting when the public can attend. So if you haven't already responded to that doodle poll, please do so because that's something that I'll be looking at tonight and uh, tomorrow and then working with Ruby um, to set up maybe a few additional meetings, either one in person and maybe a couple other virtuals um, at times other than Monday at one. But if Monday at one is an option in the doodle poll, then please feel free to keep it. I, I, um, I put time slots for, I, I pretty much slashed all, most of my regular meetings, let people know I'm not doing anything if it's not LAPAC related through the middle of November, and then offered those as doodle poll options. So feel free to check on anything that works for you. And as those results kind of rise to the top for the most people, we'll start scheduling those meetings early this week um, for, for those, those optimal time slots. Thank you. Thanks, Greg. Uh, let's see. Okay, let's get back to the survey. Okay. Um, preserving small town character is, uh, uh, you know, kind of what we saw through um, through all those lay packs. Uh, people like community centered locations and facilities for gathering spots. Uh, Really? You didn't get that doodle poll? Okay, I will send that out. Thanks. Hold on. Doodle. I will send it out again. To back members. Okay, thanks. Made a note of that one. Um, was there anything in the... Oh, Danny, I think, can speak to the next survey question. So a lot of it was talking about uh, roadway safeties. And one of the things that seemed to resonate throughout all the planning areas was an interest in multimodal transportation uh, and allowing for that. So, Danny, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? Um, yeah, I think that um, it's even with the last question that you just asked about, like, community centers and stuff, um, you know, specifically in that North Lakeport area and along Lakeshore where it's flat, essentially, um, you know, I know that sidewalks can also be like a burden, but basically making it so that those areas can be set up to have some sort of safer bikeways, essentially. The, the bikeways that are there just really aren't adequate. And we'll talk about this, I'm sure, later on when we start on the active transportation plan in the future. Um, I think that's like next year or the year after. Um, but sidewalks don't explicitly make streets safer. And in a place like Lakeshore, that might 
make a lot of sense because it's flat and you can traverse a long ways. Um, but trying to get all these individual property owners to put in a sidewalk, I think is just like not attainable. Um, so I do think that like certain areas directly like north of the school are probably important to be thinking about sidewalks. Um, unfortunately, there hasn't like been the development there that I think there should be based on how many subdivisions there are. Um, and I know there's some also tax defaulted properties in that area. Um, as far as transportation goes, one of the notes I did make uh, before was I think there was a question coming up about um, like improving transit facilities and it said something along the lines of like requiring um, property owners, new development to put in transit areas where they already exist or like exist in the future. Um, I think the other thing with that is that a lot of these bus stops might exist on county right of way, like the sort of area next to the road between the actual parcel and the road. Um, those were just some of the things that I, I just jotted down in, in this section. Um, Lakeshore specifically, because like Scotts Valley is a different type of, it needs a different type of, uh, ridership. You know, you're not going to have families riding through this area. They're not going to anywhere. There's nothing that they're getting to. You might have people working in this area who are riding out there. Um, but like the greatest good for the greatest number of people is in that North Lakeport area directly north of the school and along Lakeshore where most of the high density residential um, like mobile homes and stuff are. Thank you. Did anybody else have input regarding transportation? And roadways. And this could well, be multimodal. I agree with the uh, with what uh, Danny is referring to. I know a good friend of mine, Lee Cook, was killed on his bicycle on, on uh, Lakeshore Boulevard a couple of years ago. He rode his bike there daily and was hit. I just um, worked with the uh, survivors run down there to, uh, uh, that was at Bank of America and went down to uh, TNTs and so forth and run there. And the police department does work with uh, uh, trying to keep that run safe because they're running on half the roadway. We try to get them to run with the traffic according to the DMV uh, requirements. On Scotts Valley Road here, I know it's bikes. There's a bike lane, but they um, a lot of people are riding on against the traffic and not with the traffic per DMV codes. I ride my three-wheel bike a lot on Scotts Valley Road, and I find with the new road, it's a lot smoother to ride but the problem is people are going faster now. And many a times, a couple of times I've been run off the road because I'm, I'm watching what's going on. So the speed that uh, people are going in the DMV law says you must allow for three feet between a vehicle and a rider. So we are getting more people on bikes. And I think two things um, distracted. Both times I've been run off the road that I dodge the the person had a cell phone in their face driving. And many a times uh, at crosswalks, I see people walk into a crosswalk with the, their phone in their face and, and not paying attention to what's going on. So there's a big educational thing here, or either a need to enforce cell phone usage versus uh, what's going on out there. It doesn't happen every day, but when you lose a guy like Lee Cook, who... Uh, who was run over because somebody was looking at their cell phone, it's, uh, their cell phone, pretty bad. Yeah, absolutely. Cornelia just joined us. Yay. Cornelia, do you want to just give a quick introduction of yourself to the group? And this is Teams. It's a little different than Zoom. There should be a microphone icon up at the top of your window, meeting window that you can click on to. There you go. Excellent. Yeah, this is my first time with this um, set up here. I'm Cornelia Sieber Davis. I live in Scotts Valley. And I just joined because I just found out about it, thanks to Margot's email. And um, so I have no clues. I don't only really... Uh, get involved and interfere with your meeting. I uh, just joined when Danny said 
something um, about priority for something, something about a road. And that's that was my first word here. And um, when I first moved here 25 years ago, I there was um, the the pedal pedal to the puddle pedal to the puddle uh, that you became the Canocti Challenge, and they mm-hmm. always use Scott Sally Road for the the bike ride, and it was extremely dangerous, but a very nice ride, and um, you know to go from Lake port to blue lakes uh i see a lot of tourists taking that route on their bicycles and i know it's not a high density population area but i think if if we want to dream big having a a separate bike road or lane or trail parallel to scotts valley road would be my ideal dream for horses too, we have a lot of horses that take up the road, and I'm guilty of going over the 45 mile an hour speed limit. I, it's hard not to, but um, so that that's my two cents. Thanks. Thank you. I'm glad you're here. I'm glad. Thanks, Margot, for spreading the word. Let's see. Moving on offer, past. Yeah. Oh, just another. Yeah thought that I had um, along with the speeds um, this also sort of plays into what was just said about the like oh I'm guilty of driving over I'm guilty of driving over the speed limit too Um, a lot of uh, Scotts Valley that makes a lot of sense having an alternate system to get you through Scotts Valley just because the road speeds are so high it's really not compatible for people who aren't confident cyclists Um, as far as uh, Lakeshore goes. Um, one of the other things I was thinking of is that the way that housings abut the street also sort of induces that that high speed, where you do have those those deep setbacks um, in specific areas where there's like straightaways. It's very easy for that speed to get up high. Um, mm. It's just. It's just something to think about specifically with the Lakeshore area. And again, I'm, I focus so much on that area just because there is such a high portion of kids who take that road every single day to get to school. So um, yeah, less confident cyclist, sort of what I'm thinking about. Yeah. Good. So if, we're, if, we, if we've had our say on transportation, the next questions had to deal with preservation of different things, um, different assets or parts of our community. One of them was about historical and cultural um, resources, saving those. And pretty much across all the surveys, the top option, prioritizing preservation and adaptive reuse, um, kind of was the, the high the winner as far as the number of surveys who clicked that. Um, so I was wondering what this what this body thinks about uh, drafting an ordinance to preserve historic structures. Have you heard anything about it out in the community? Or has anybody given it any thought? I'd say Maria? no. I know that. Oh. I I was I haven't heard as many um, outside of the city limits of the historic preservation. I could be very wrong there. I know there are some buildings that are older, and also historic preservation in 2024 means something different than it did 20 years ago, right? Where it's like now things in you know following World War II are considered you know can be considered historic in some versions. So um, mm-hmm. I would defer to other people's but that's my uh, understanding. (laughs) Well, Betsy, you had something? Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, For many, many years at the beginning of the, at the end of the 90s and the early 2000s, there was a group of people that uh, was comprised of the museum um, uh, curators, uh, people from the, uh, golly, uh, a, 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 um, uh, a land, uh, land use group, um, uh, one of the uh, 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 people that uh, validates your deeds, I can't remember what they're called, but anyway, it was to, to update and, and get approved Article 68 of the County Zoning Ordinance specific to historical preservation and uh, not, not necessarily focused on uh, 
cultural influence, cultural resources, which we interpret largely as tribal or Native American uh, resources. There are a couple of um, locations in Scotts Valley, specifically the Glen Eden Schoolhouse, which is a, uh, I think it's a, a county maintained park. It's the location where people will take their horse trailers and then uh, take their uh, horses and ride up over the trail from Glen Eden over to Vichy Springs uh, in, uh, in, uh, in western Ukiah uh, area. Uh, it's, a, it's a pretty popular trail, very narrow, very hazardous, uh, but that little Glen Eden schoolhouse is a very precious uh, type of place. I mean, we have, have a, sub, a similar uh, effort to protect that uh, uh, schoolhouse out in the Finley area, which is a whole other other deal. But we do in Scotts Valley, we have that. And then we have the former Grange, which is a, um, a, a defunct entity, but it had uh, a little building there on the, uh, adjacent to the, uh, the uh, property zoned by the Hall families. Uh, there's a, there was a, uh, a corporation yard that was used by uh, Henning Lindeblad to maintain all of the Army Corps of Engineers uh, uh, heavy equipment when they were building the levees to reclaim the wetlands in Scotts Valley. Uh, so there's some antiquity there if they haven't completely obliterated all that. And then I'm sure that Jared Hendricks uh, will have uh, other uh, knowledge of this. He's a third generation rancher there. Uh, there may be some like some important bridges. Um, we have the the only the only public meeting room, which is privately owned by the Clear Lake Trowel and Trellis Club, otherwise known as the Women's um, uh, Club. I think they're on Hendricks Road. Uh, it's the only location where people can have a public meeting. They have to make arrangements with the owners. They do not have any kind of. Uh, they will not allow any kind of communication. A technology to be to be located out there, uh, so you know they may consider that to be a kind of a quote unquote historical uh, building. Uh, so those are the three suggestions I make. But but uh, the Article 68 is where the uh, foundation has been laid uh, for that uh, ordinance. Hmm. Thank you. That's interesting. There are a number of tourists that like to look at historical landmarks throughout the Napa Valley, Scotts, I mean, Lake County and so forth. And I always refer them to the Chamber of Commerce for an index of uh, locations. And and still, they don't find them all there. They still ask about it. But uh, as far as the Scotts Valley Women's Club, uh, you have to just contact the president. She's the one that lives near there with a the key. And she does open that up, uh, work with uh, different groups for public meetings. They also hold other group meetings there for sewing and a number of different things, but uh, they're self-sustaining. Cool. Jared, I saw you unmuted. Did you have anything to add on that one? Oh, maybe it froze. All right, that's good stuff. Well, Jared, if you unfreeze, Sometimes if you turn your camera off, it helps with uh, bandwidth on broadband. Let's keep going. Um, illegal dumping and um, other nuisance issues. Pretty much these answers were all the same. You know, um, help to support uh, enforcement or, or it, it do more enforcement on illegal dumping and abandoned vehicles, uh, but also come alongside the community and um, lower some of the obstacles like dumping fees or having like amnesty dumping days or uh, services to support our older um, or low income, you know, residents to help them make sure that they can get their stuff disposed of as well. Uh, that was pretty standard. Could I add but, to that real quick? Absolutely. Yes. Um, one of the things on the uh, upper part of Scotts Valley Road, or the, I should say lower part near Lakeport, a lot of people that apparently work out in this area. Uh, I'm not going to mention the group, but they go to the fast food places for uh, for lunch. And 
every day when I ride my bike, my little basket is full of McDonald's uh, lids and cups and Burger King boxes or bags and uh, with some uh, Taco Bell uh, things, I, and I pick it up every day. It's a we are a littering point from them getting lunch, driving back out to Scotts Valley, and it's on my property. It's all along the front part here. As they go by, I watch them go by when I'm working the front yard. They just throw it out like it's a uh, no big deal, and so uh, it's um, it takes. We need to look at adopt a highway, adopt a roads thing to help keep things cleaner. But we have a beautiful county and we trash it. We are a lot of people just plain pigs about throwing stuff out the window. And we do have a beautiful county. It would be amazing somehow if there was more emphasis on adopt a road or you can't find everybody for throwing a straw or a thing out. You never catch them but it is a nuisance mess and it's something I like to keep my property clean as a neighbor and I have to go out every day and, and clean it from trash. Thank you. It's tough. I have a suggestion that other counties have done um, that I lived in the Bay Area. It's, it's um, uh, more of an outreach effort from the county that they could just put and I'm I'm surprised it works, but it really does. Is is just a reminder, uh, maybe little tiny uh, infographic type thing of somebody, you know, putting a big X through a hand going out the window dumping trash. It's just a reminder, you know, that somebody has to pick this up. And if it's just maybe some PSA uh, public service announcements, like periodically or billboards or something, these kind of things matter. It's like, take pride in your community, right? And remember mm -hmm. that there's another human being out there who lives there and has to pick this blank, blank stuff up. It might help, I don't Good. know. Good, like signage along the roadways. There's a couple of other things. First of all, there's a $1,000 fine from the uh, Department of uh, Motor Vehicles we don't have enforcement of that, and we just never have enforcement of, of any of these re regulations. Um, but also uh, the pro prohibition uh, for uh, discharging trash into the waterways, the drainages, the stormwater um, uh, watersheds as part of the Lake County Clean Water Program. There's ample um, outreach and education materials on the websites at the County Department of Water Resources. Um, th they've done um, social media, uh, TV8, uh, uh, Lake County, uh, Facebook uh, pages, all kinds of things. And uh, maybe the, the uh, area plan uh, or the general plan outreach and education could promote those because they already exist. Good. So I'm thinking of the people who don't read and who don't ever pay attention. They might possibly, um, the, the ones that Greg was talking about, you know, who, who work there, who don't live there, who might just could use a gentle reminder with a sign every hundred feet or something. <laughs> like, I don't know, just an additional, it doesn't cost too much, I don't think. Yeah, no, this is good stuff. This actually, um, the way you would find this then in a local area plan would be a priority of um, enforcing codes or priority of um, public outreach. So that could reflect itself in like an objective, like um, uh, county will support public outreach efforts. Uh, for, uh, including road signage and um, public service announcements regarding illegal dumping, something like that. So this is all really helpful input because what you are doing right now is talking about the community priorities that will then resonate within that local area plan and, and be part of that document. So keep it coming. Keep your suggestions coming. This is good stuff. The next section of the, of the survey talked about um, access to healthy food. 
which I think Scotts Valley area, um, not so much North Lakeport, which tends to be mostly um, subdivisions. It's got some vineyards and stuff, but but Scotts Valley is an ag area. And so I was thinking that there there's probably some good input regarding encouraging access to healthy food what the survey which these answers were pretty much the same for all the surveys on this particular topic is that we want to improve um, programs that'll increase food security um, like food assistance hunger programs things like that but also expo expand the local food access and ag by encouraging more farmers markets uh, urban farming, community gardening, food forests, and other similar activities. I was wondering if the LAPAC had any input about local food access issues. Um, I mean, I'd I immediately talk to think... <laughs> Go ahead, Cornelia. Go ahead, Danny, and then Cornelia. All right. All right. I've, um, with North Lakeport specifically, I mean, I think you have the same problem that kind of ties in with the transportation, where people don't have access to healthy food in in their location um you know sentry is not close safeway is not close you have the gas station um essentially is is really the highest access point for so many people um and that is not and and that's not to say that the gas station doesn't explicitly have healthy food but um you know like a farmer's market in their parking lot for example could be a way to counteract that because we already know that's like an access point um, that a lot of people are going to go to. It's sort of like if we know people are already access accessing that place, how do we make better available options at that sort of community center? Um, yeah, I just think access is really hard in North Lakeport. But Cornelia, I know you have a thing or two about farmers markets you could add. <laughs> I could speak an hour on this topic. At least an hour, um, yeah. But I'll try not to. At least, at least an hour. I've been involved with the farmer's markets uh, since 2005 and uh, Master Gardener before that. And um, I have intimate <clears throat> experience with trying to get farmers to grow food in Lake County for at least that long. And... <clears throat> <clears throat> including myself, growing food is very, very difficult um, in Lake County, especially. And uh, I guess having more farmers markets would be wonderful, but without having more farmers, it's just going to, it's not going to work. You need to have, to be a viable farmer's market, you need to have at least eight um, agricultural producers there. Um, to attract enough customers to make it a viable business, and I could go on and on and on. So encouraging more agriculture um, besides vineyards and, and, you know, the bigger pears and walnuts, which are really important to us, um, but more um, vegetables grains and beef or cattle, um, sheep, goats, anything that, that could increase the type of agriculture that will also help us with food security. And food security is not just access to supermarkets or farmers markets. It's about the whole county producing more food where we consume less than 1% of the food we, I mean, produce less than 1% of the food we consume in this county. And easily cut off from the rest of the world by natural disasters. Uh, to me, it's extremely important. I'm on the Food Policy um, Council with the Board of Supervisors, and we talk about this a lot. It's just a really complicated um, problem, And uh, but as far as the Lake Area Plan is concerned, if we can focus on making it um, more comprehensive in the way we reach out to people growing food, the way we assist older people who um, um, who uh, have to transition out of farming because of physical uh, limitations. They tend to sell to developers. Mini ranches go in, which means no food production. Um, so for me, focus focusing on that first, or at least equally, would help a lot more than. Um, 
just building another store or another farmer's market. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's great. Margo, your name tile keeps flashing. Was there something you wanted to add to this? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, along the lines that Cornelia suggested, you know, in- increasing more the number of farmers uh, producing local food, um, thinking outside the box is uh, looking at other types of agriculture or, or forms, such as uh, vertical gardening and making use of some of the spaces that we have that are now vacant, like retail, um, and converting that into vertical gardens or somehow using more of a, you know, technology like hydroponics to produce food. So that would be on a smaller scale, but it could also uh, be for immediate local consumption. So that that's um, one of the things that I suggest is that we, we look at ways that we can encourage more local food production among um, our, our own residents and taking advantage of vacant space that we already have that is just um, right now unproductive. Okay, that's good. Yeah, but I could see that going into an area plan um, expressing that like reuse of vacant commercial parcels or properties or structures, um, allowing uses of, of agricultural uses to take place in there, which would then get reflected in a zoning yeah. Um, ordinance. Yeah, good stuff. And, and also, um, in the survey, they referred to that kind of as urban gardening. You know, like Very good. Like, yeah, I yeah. kind of see that as the same stuff. Good. I also have another suggestion. It's more along the lines of perhaps policy, and that's to encourage maybe a different kind of CSA, you know, community supported agriculture, where um, we, we as a community somehow help connect the farmer to um, a community of subscribers so they can get fresh produce on a regular basis. And then that helps the farmer just focus uh, focusing on growing and uh, producing crops and not having to worry about marketing <laughs> and other parts of, you know, the enterprise. Mm-hmm. Good. Anything else on ag? If not, we'll move on to uh, health care, which, again, the answers in healthcare care were pretty much straight across the board on all planning areas. I, so. I, I would like to add a comment on this agricultural Please. question. Go, Betsy. Um, when, I, when I moved here in the year 2000, all the grocery stores had sections in the market for ball jars for canning and canning equipment. There were, the Hunger Task Force was teaching home canning. Uh, this was a very popular thing in this area. What has happened is that not only are some of those uh, small gardeners uh, aging out of the ability to do that gardening, but the cost of water is so prohibitive in some of these areas that they can no longer grow the food in their gardens. And that is a, is a potential uh, area where we could, if we could increase water storage and um uh, conservation might be uh, something we can to uh, to support that small gardening and community gardens are extremely uh, productive if you have a group of people uh, you know even with the, just a small section of a, of a lot that you uh, put uh, raised beds in things like that we have a community garden in Lucerne uh, that's really popular they get their water from the lake and it's not this they don't have to filter it uh, so that the water issue is very crucial Good. Good. Thank you, Betsy. Access to quality health care. Um, is there anything that people want to say about that other than the stuff that we kind of already know? We need more health care. It's great to expand services. Let's try harder to retain doctors. Um, I kind of see expansion of healthcare service access linked really closely to our broadband uh, rollout in that it allows a lot of, um, it, it allows access to our residents to medical professionals and services that may not be local. You know, I, I, I just went and got my eyes checked over at Costco and uh, it, I did have one guy there, a technician doing the machines, you know, 
put your chin here, look over there, that kind of thing. But the actual um, medical professional was was virtual. She was getting those reports in real time and doing the advice there. And so anyway, that's just kind of my thought. What do you all think? I have thoughts more specifically about the area located around the hospital, but I think I'll wait until we're kind of looking at the map maybe a little later. Bob, I would expect some helpful stuff out of you. What are your insights as to uh, access to healthcare? I think what you brought up is a, a game changer that we've been able to see a lot more people in the county health-wise and draw in uh, specialists that we didn't have access to before. So I, I think uh, telemedicine is medicine of the future. I think things like having healthy foods is also in the health category. So mm -hmm. I, I think we're, uh, we're touching upon important subjects. Excellent. I have a suggestion oh. on. Yeah, Margo. Uh, thanks. One uh, way we can try to address the shortage of medical professionals is to grow our own. And there are programs that medical schools have to, uh, well, for underserved rural areas such as ours. So if we can. Um, take a concerted effort and take a look into those programs. And if they don't suit our needs, well, then maybe we tailor an existing program, part, find a, a good partner or partners um, so we can um, encourage our youth to go into um, the health professions, get um, good um, support in terms of internships and paid internships, scholarships, so they can get to uh, college, university, and then med school, and then there'd be an agreement. If the county helps subsidize, um, say, a, a local youth education, there'd be an understanding or maybe a contract that that youth would serve our community for at least 10 years or, you know, fill in the blank for how many years or until, the, you know, the promissory note, if that's going to be used, um, is is paid back. But um, Thank you. you know, yeah, we we're not attracting um, the health professionals that we need. So we need to look at new ideas. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Sure thing. Greg, your tile is blinking. We need to continue to build a good relationship with the lifelight type of uh, agencies. Uh, every year I pay the dues to lifelight, even though my insurance covers it, because I, I want to add my little part of just keeping them in service for our county. Our hospitals are not capable of handling a lot of trauma to a certain extent. And to apply to uh, over the Sacramento area or down to San Francisco or even Santa Elena, uh, you see that life flight, the uh, red copter flying quite often. And so to ensure that, I hope that they're making enough money off the fees for people to save the very expensive bill if they didn't have that or other things to, to do that. Those are the type of services with the level of expertise on how to handle critical things right now is a very needed service. Uh, time driving from an ambulance versus a helicopter is a big difference. Yeah, good point. Go ahead, Betsy. Okay, let her rip. First of all, we do not have urgent care. We need 24-hour urgent care to reduce the load on ERs. Um, what we have is rapid care, which uh, only operates mostly during the same business hours as the hospitals and the clinics. What we need is evening and weekend service for families with kids where the parents are working, the kids are in school, but you know, keep those kids healthy. And, uh, you know, maybe somebody that's, moderately injured on the job, something like that. You know, the, the load on the ERs is enormous. Um, we don't have any preventive care programs anymore for older adults and caregivers. Those used to be funded through the public health department um, around the middle of 2000, early 2000s. They had to abandon those because they could get the money, but the money wasn't sufficient to attract the wages of registered nurses. 
And so there's that problem. We have to uh, provide better wages for our in-home support service workers. The, the workforce itself is aging. The state is threatening to take away the county ability to negotiate with the union. The unions uh, have to capitulate to the Board of Supervisors and uh, take the position of the uh, California uh, Association of uh, uh, Counties, CSAC, whatever it is, uh, which is uh, opposed to doing anything to improve the wages and compensation for in-home support service workers. we got to fix that. The county government can do that. Um, we also had, uh, back in 2011, Lake Area Planning Council came up with a plan for non-emergency medical transportation uh, for people to get to the doctor. One of the things I have encountered over the last 25 years as a peer counselor is the number of isolated older adults who just don't have the way to get from their houses if they're moderately disabled to get to the doctor. That's preventive care. We can do something about that. We have the Canocti uh, School uh, down there in uh, Lower Lake. I can't remember exactly what it's called, but it's a magnet school, which uh, provides high school preparatory classes, advanced preparation classes for kids that want to go into the nursing fields, become CNAs, all that kind of stuff. I mean, those are those are beneficial programs. And the last thing is really, really um, very important. We have a conflict over the uh, supplies and funding for ambulance services, ground ambulance services for inter-facility transfers, uh, and also uh, to solve the problems where the um, uh, staff of the ambulance has to wait at the hospital to hand off the patient, we can streamline that. Uh, the Emergency Medical Care Committee has a whole set of priorities, and uh, the ambulance services are licensed under the control of the public health department, but we have to have a better financial agreement with the hospitals who receive those patients. So those are just some of the, the suggestions I have. Thank you. Good. Thank you. And for those of you who, I don't know if there's anybody here who doesn't know Betsy, but just in case you don't, um, she's long been an advocate for the Area Agency on Aging. So a, a lot of her expertise isn't just in uh, water issues, but also in healthcare as it pertains to our senior citizens. So thank you, Betsy. That's good stuff. Um, let's see. How about supporting? Okay, just a quick time check. It's 2.06. Uh, our meeting is scheduled to go until 2.30. I want to make sure that Bob has enough time to talk about his project. Um, and But we are almost at the end of the survey. So I'm going to skip vital community resources and services because the answers in Lakeport were the exact same as all the other surveys. We want uh, community resiliency centers that um, will help in times of emergency, but also serve as community gathering locations and centers for, um, you know, community cohesiveness. So if, it, if anybody had anything on that one, if not, we're going to skip to local and small businesses, supporting local and small businesses. Let's say y'all. Anything? If not, we're going to move on to tourism. Supporting tourism economy. Does that float your boat? If not, we're going to move on to maintaining a healthy lo local economy. And then actually, let's move on to wildfire. How should the general plan work to reduce wildfire risk in our county? I'll tell you that... Go ahead. I was going to say prioritizing uh, high density residential within fire breaks. So on the inside of Highway 20 rather than on the outside. Okay. Or like more infill 29. housing development. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's Good. a simple thing, you know, where evacuation routes already exist. Yeah. Yeah. And through all the other surveys, the top two priorities were mainly. Um, Enforcing the code regarding hazardous vegetation management, as well as coming alongside and supporting hazardous vegetation management with programs for elderly and lower income uh, residents also. What else can we add? Greg, I know you're active in this field. Well, I think that every time we uh, grow in a certain area, uh, part of the county subdivisions, a multi-story or multi-residential things, that there ought to be a plan amongst all the fire district to agree upon that the contractor will include into that subdivision a fire station equipment to, to be staffed to serve that area. 
And right now, when you have a call for a first alarm uh, structure fire, uh, in all the fire districts, the main equipment goes out, and you have to have other agencies move equipment in here to back them up or to reinforce it. So we're very slim on an initial attack of having equipment. It's often other uh, agencies as part of that initial attack. So when we look at the services, increasing the services, uh, we have a station out here by uh, on Highway 29 uh, north of town. It's unstaffed. It sits there vacant. We don't have the staffing for people. Uh, we it's really in an area that maybe that station should have could have been somewhere else have been a lot more closer to uh, uh, residential areas to serve that uh, we don't have the water uh, mains to support that and, and so forth so as we look at a county plan uh, we have a number of fire districts that that get along well together but you still have your boundary lines how do you um, how do we create in future growth when we're building different things that need to be added such as fire protections as fire stations water systems and things like that secondly if uh, if if it's experimental soil it ain't going to burn and public resources code uh, 3291 requires that space around that it's a state uh, um, resource if we we don't have the staffing even cal fire doesn't have the staffing to enforce it but somehow, if we start and can get that enforced, make the fine noticeable enough that if you don't clean your property up, it's going to be done. Now we're not going to be burning down a lot of houses as exposures from fires or our next door neighbors. There's all so much we can do in regards to hardening the enforcement as well as the education of dispensable, uh, dispensable space around the property. Uh, a lot of people are losing insurance because of the major wildfires. People are, uh, they're leaving, uh, the insurance companies are leaving uh, uh, people that have been paying 20 to 30 years of insurance to them, and all of a sudden they're leaving them high and dry. Why is that? Because we're losing homes such as in Paradise, which was never, the clearance around structures there were, were nil. That's why the whole town burned down. There was no maintenance of that. You look at the Valley Fire up there, Top and Cobb, where it went through years and years of high growth, no management, no fuel break maintenance, and no control burning to 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 uh, uh, lessen the fuel load in there in a mosaic value. There's a number of different systems, but it all takes money and staffing to do it. But some of the things can be done, like really tough enforcement and defensible space. And getting rid of that flammable vegetation around the houses and following that. <clears throat> so, a planning of future stations when sub as we grow, having fire districts work together on understanding that these stations can be beneficial, it doesn't matter which district it's in. And then it comes to the question of staffing those stations with firefighters. That's a lot of money. Mm -hmm. and of course, people here, just like our law enforcement people, firefighters, they get on the job for two or three years and they can look at the next county over and go for, the, uh, again, double the pay of what they're making here. We are a training ground for the law enforcement. <laughs> and firefighters were a training ground and they leave. Good, thank you. Cornelia? I'm, I'll be real quick. This could go along, be a long conversation, but we have um, other groups meeting on these topics and it would be really good to get more um, input, you know, when we meet for the firewise communities, the Lake County Fire <laughs> Council has, has uh, monthly meetings. All these places, um, all these groups can help help with the details of that and one of the things that scotts valley could do or have is a substation halfway along um scotts valley between lake port and blue lakes which um ha i have been told by the insurance companies would put almost every resident within the five mile um limit that they have for being protected right now we're at six between six and seven miles and so this station would not have to be staffed it just has to be built according to the fire chief's um, specs and have water storage and accessibility for fire um, 
personnel and trucks to re- restock their supplies because like in the, in the big fire that we had where both ends were burning, you know, Lakeport was burning and Blue Lakes was burning. There were probably 10 huge um, fire trucks on Long Scott's Valley and they had really no way to get out to get more supplies. And so that, that kind of stuff would, hopefully could be addressed as a sort of a in-between measure for for um, lowering insurance and supporting the fire personnel um, even though they you know they have hiring issues at this point thank you make sense so yep thanks betsy did you have something oh you betcha so First of all, we have a community wildfire protection plan that was created in 2009. It was updated in 2023. There is no implementation plan. Uh, it's also cited as one of the action items in the current natural hazard mitigation plan. Again, that uh, plan uh, provides the uh, foundational um, uh, basis for applying for grants. For grants uh, that many, many agencies are applying for the similar types of grants. So we have a best fits grants committee of the uh, Fire Safe Council. I believe that's uh, where that belongs or one of RCD or something. Extend risk reduction, yeah. Okay, yeah, thank you. And then Valley where there are no uh, fire suppression, uh, water flows, hydrants, storage facilities, all that kind of thing. The federal government two years ago released a billion dollars for uh, infrastructure improvements, including upgrading and installation of new uh, fire um, suppression um, services. Uh, we have 17 areas in the county that have inadequate or, or missing uh, fire suppression flows. Uh, we could uh, c- coordinate with that. Uh, the uh, state county, uh, the state Department of Housing and Community Development has a new uh, recovery division, which would cover most of the matching funds for that federal grant, which is very steep. But we need to get that and, and actually uh, be very aggressive about putting in these fire systems, uh, water systems, including the annexation of, Main, of South Main Street or the cooperation of the city and the county to get those uh, uh, that uh, pavement widening program uh, done and then install the water and sewer lines. Uh, so that you can have fire suppression flows in South Main Street, which has millions of dollars of um, uh, commercial and light industrial uh, businesses, a very high risk area. Uh, we also have the state disaster recovery framework, which uh, should be uh, incorporated in all of our fire prevention uh, programs. Uh, we have the home hardening uh, funding from the state of California, that's one project. Last week at the Board of Supervisors, you yourself, Maria, presented a great uh, uh, multi-million dollar code upgrade project to bring substandard older housing uh, into less fire risk conditions. Uh, I think that people need to know about that and be participating in that. I don't know where that's going to go next. We also have the Wildland Urban Interface Land Use and Zoning designations that may be out of sync with the with the U.S. Forest Service uh, jurisdictions for the wildland urban interface, which all of the North Shore communities have. Uh, those are opportunities for getting funding and, and uh, providing that. Finally, the Office of Planning and Research uh, 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 issued a technical advisory associated with general planning uh, that uh, no longer is applied to only new development. Most of our general plan policies in this regard uh, say we're going to do this for new development. We have to get over that concept. We're not going to have massive new development in the County of Lake. We're not going to have major planned unit subdivisions, but those infill projects like Danny's talking about, all that city, everybody's policy is uh, smart growth using infill, and uh, we need to uh, maximize that uh, option uh, along with the Office of the State Fire Marshal subdivision mapping of the vulnerable subdivisions with only one way in and one way out roads and developing secondary evacuation um, uh, resources. Uh, that's already on the books with the state and we have this uh, obligation to take care of those. Thank you. Thank you. Good. Okay, Margo, I can see your tile um, before you before we go to you. we have I want to cover flood risk. 
uh, what okay. the county can do to mitigate flood risk. And then after that, I want to make sure that Bob has a few minutes for his project. So um, go ahead and add what you're going to add, Margo. No, we'll move on. Thanks, thanks, Maria. This is quick. So, in terms of um, trying to mitigate fire risk, I suggest that um, when it comes to development in rural areas or where there is very, very high fire risk, that greater attention be paid to road and fire safety requirements, such as roads being 4290 and 4291 compliant. Thanks. Good. Okay. Lastly, for just a couple minutes, um, or if we need input, if, um, if we need to run over, I think we can. I don't know. I got a, I'm not sure on Teams. I know Zooms has no problem, but Teams sent me a notice on the last one saying, oh, you have 15 minutes left in the meeting. So I don't know if it's going to cut me off. So that's why I'm kind of uh, becoming a little hyper vigilant about the time we have remaining. So the general plan flood risk. Uh, ideas for what the county can do. I know this hits Scotts Valley pretty close to the heart. So um, I'll tell you what the survey said that just ensure that the dams and levees are properly maintained, but then secondarily, also just making sure that ongoing development uh, takes into account stormwater retention, uh, reducing uh, or updating stormwater infrastructure design, stuff like that. Those were the top two answers on the survey. Is there anything that you wanted to add? Yeah. I. You know, in Scotts Valley, we've been trying to look at the levy re repair and replacement and maintenance program, which is a long ways away. And we, um, for the first time, looks like we're going to be able to start cleaning up some of the drainage ditches and that the uh, county is gonna, has committed to, which is a, uh, great news out here for us. We have, like I said, every rainy year, we have a certain section of the valley. People are flooded out. They can't get in and out. And it is really a huge inconvenience. So when you compare the uh, the broken down levee system that does no longer prevent that, the ditching and so forth, the creek that needs to be cleaned out uh, and um, gravel moved out of there, and then the amount of rain that just comes off the uh, Cow Mountain area that hits and just flows down in, in, into the creek and causes that is a real um, a tough challenge for us to uh, to look at. Uh, in the old days, they used to take uh, equipment out there and clean the creek out. Now, with all the environmental and historical concerns, that no longer happens, and there has to be a prep of studies and and so forth, things done in order to, before you can even put a shovel in the dirt anymore to move things. So consequently, Scotts Valley is frustrated over the years of the flooding, continuous flooding, where those people can't get in and out. And uh, we, uh, the advisory committee has worked very hard trying to figure out how we can move things forward to get where we can actually put a shovel in the dirt. And it just doesn't happen because of the multiple studies, resources, and now loss of funding to do that. So. Uh, it's an important thing for every year for those folks. Uh, we have the uh, use of the agricultural for water out here, the hitch thing, a number of other issues that uh, complicate things to try to work through. So, yes, we'd like to look at how can those levees be created, built and maintained for the future. Good. Thank you. Betsy, you've got two minutes. Okay, over to, to I'll Bob. be really fast. I'll be really fast. Okay. First of all, there is the, only the city of Clear Lake is a member of the flood insurance program, the federal flood insurance program. No other areas of the county are actually uh, designated as risks under that program. If those, uh, if our areas are designated, then new mortgage holders would be required to have flood insurance, and that's a whole other economic impact. But the fact is, we have designated floodplains, but no, um, no management. Uh, Actually, the county does oversee the National Flood Insurance Program. It was with the Water Resources Department, but Community Development has recently taken it on, and we have. We're only doing the mapping. There's no insurance available because we don't have flood insurance designated areas for them to uh, provide that flood insurance. All right, let's talk about that offline. That's interesting. We, okay, uh, we so might want to address that sooner than, okay. than the area plan. Um, yeah, there, keep going. There, 
As far as the Scotts Valley watershed is concerned, there's a proposal for a major watershed uh, restoration project with uh, federal funding under the uh, stormwater uh, management program that's at the Department of Water Resources right now. Uh, we The former uh, Lake uh, Lakeport Lake project that was federally funded for a number of years is defunct, um, but we could be doing things like uh, vegetative swales, uh, 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 sediment detention ponds, and, and things like that. We're never going to fix that road because it's just impossible since they channelized the creek alongside there. If people want to know whether they're in a risk area, if their property's in a risk area, there's a great website. It's www.water.ca.gov forward slash my flood risk. You just put in your address or your APN number. It'll tell you right there. Um, it's really fast, really easy, and really um, uh, very beautiful. Thank you. Good. Perfect timing. Excellent. Okay, Bob, we're going to switch over now to the... Um, uh, to Bob's request, if you could give me that street address, I've got GIS pulled up and we'll, we'll focus on it so everybody can see what you're talking about. 670 Walnut. All right, I'm sharing screen. Well, that's not what I need to share. Where's the screen? 670 Walnut. All right, Lake Port. See, I can't spell when everybody's watching me. Do you want an AP number? Yeah, that might be, that might be good to see what we get right now. There we go. Okay, so. Sorry, that's my dog. Zoom in. All right. Okay. Does that look like the right one? Right there, yes. Bob? Yeah. Okay. So you can see this housing down here, down the hill toward the lake. This is the parcel that um, Bob's been working on for years. Go ahead, Bob. Yeah, it's a parcel I've been working on for about 20 years. Uh, it was historically uh, the bottom part was a higher density. It was, it had a dual zoning and during a, uh, a process like what's going on now, they thought it was too steep. But uh, I've gone to the uh, surveyor. He says the steepness is not there. That bottom part between the two yellow parts is what I'd like to use for senior housing and keep the rest of the property relatively open for trails and community gardens. Uh, the, there's high density right next to it in that tan colored. Um, the area right above that is flat. It has infrastructure. It has, uh, it, it's close to where the people, if they're seniors would have access to the hospital. Um, so, what I would be requesting is to have the higher zoning brought back just for that lower part uh, so it could be uh, a senior housing project. Good. So you can kind of see, is that lower part that you're talking about the part that has the roads on it right there, kind of bladed in? Yes. Okay, so what you have right now, everybody, is the general plan land use designation map. The whole parcel is zoned for rural residential, which is limited in housing development. Right next to it is, is what we call high density residential. So if I understand your request, Bob, it is to have this orange or the high density residential expand into this lower portion of the parcel. Is that correct? Yeah, correct. Okay. Even lower than that. You know, just, All right. It, it, I'm going to put a, that slope map back on there, that overlay, so people can see what we're talking about as far as the hills. So this yellow is about 10 to 20 percent slope. The the gray is like zero, um, but then this red, actually the yellow is zero to 10. The red is 10 to 20, and green is over 20. So the hilly stuff really starts on this side, kind of levels out again as you get up towards the top of that hill. But then this area. Um, both the flat stuff and the yellow. That's what you're talking about, right, Bob? Correct. Okay, good. 
So that is the request. Does the late pack have any input before Zoom or f- Teams might actually kill us, kill this meeting? Um, if not, if we have consensus right now, we'll just add it to the recommendations. Or if you'd like to talk about it, we can add it to our in-person you know, all hovering around the maps kind of meeting. Um, and and I can bring additional maps that you can use for consideration, like the the slopes and the, the general plan, stuff like that. Does anybody have any questions of Bob? How um, many housing units? I was thinking um, senior housing like fraternities have, where it would be a... Uh, maybe four six bedroom houses and they'd run it with with a community kitchen so four houses just kind of on the larger size of a house right okay any other questions i have a question maria do we have a senior like a, a zone zoning for senior specific no okay Thank you. What we do have are some allowances for density bonus or um, um, concessions, which would be like relief from certain development standards uh, because senior housing does count as a sensitive population. And so there are some additional options that could be um, uh, taken advantage of in a development that was limited towards uh, senior housing. but we don't have any overlays. I think it's a great idea. Awesome. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Sorry, I'll, I I'll be getting to you. I think it's a great idea, Bob, and I hope that you have success. There's, um, you know, the community uh, aspect of your idea, I think will help, um, will help with many other issues that were brought up today. Thank you. See? Uh, yeah, Dr. Bob, I'll be uh, messaging you about this because you know that's close to my heart. Uh, we do need uh, special uh, considerations. I was appointed to the General Plan Advisory Committee for the subject of senior support services, and there is no actual explicit section in the general plan to address that. So uh, I'd like to collaborate with you on uh, coming up with some policies and how we can embed those. And, of course, with Maria and everybody else, you know, this is a great awesome. thing. Definitely need it. Thank you so much. Thanks. Becky. Great. Anything from Danny and Greg? It looks like Teams doesn't kick me off, but I'll just, we'll just close the meeting off with this. I think it's it's a good idea. I think I would still like to look at this uh, as with, with more people and have more eyes on this, not necessarily because of this specific project, but because of the whole zoning situation in between highway 29 and the lakeshore. Um, I think kind of looking at what a lot of those properties actually serve as and what they're zoned for is going to be like critically important. Cause I could go to a dozen other properties that are not like, zoned sort of high enough but are serving sort of the same function as high density residential so i i would be fine with it going to high density residential but i think we also need to look at um like a lot of the other parcels around it and um also i'd just be interested in a little bit more details as to the um adjacent parcels um and also access um, on the uh, hill road Side. Good. I'll make sure that we have those maps available because you'll see then the subdivision to the south that already has those access roads stubbed out. Um, so yeah, ac- access to those parcels as far as what Bob is proposing uh, is kind of already historically been set up. So, but we'll we'll make sure that you can get the tools that you need to see the surrounding areas. Greg, thanks. Bob, it'd be interesting if there could be a fire station with an ambulance in that area. For that future there. That's just something to check with the fire service, see what their thoughts are, include them into what your plan is so they can support it with uh, the proper care in need of an emergency response. Just a thought. Cool. That would think that would be good. There's a good flat area up above that's not part of the senior housing. And I would say, you know, as for a meeting with the fire chief, 
discuss that with them, show them your, what your plans are so they can try to give you supportive ideas about how we can make that the best we can. Great. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. So we have a, just a couple housekeeping. Um, I wanted your feedback on when we do our, our Lakeport specific LAPAC meeting, do you think that I should request that we go out to that women's center road on Hendricks or is there another place like the, uh, I, my usual go-to is uh, board chambers. What, what do you think as far as what would offer the most opportunity or easiest access for members of the public? Maria, if you, if you want the uh, Scotts Valley Women's Club, I can give you the name of the contact for that, if you Thanks. wish. Okay. I just, you don't know how to get a con. Uh, I, I, your number, there's no answer, so I need a cell phone, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, I don't know if this is, you know, uh, people like Betsy can't attend if it's at the Women's Club because it's really, I mean, it's not really beneficial as far as distance compared to the Board of Supervisors or even the Lakeport uh, Conference Room. There are just about, you know, they're so close by that the trouble that you would get have to do to set it up for Zoom would be a waste of time. The Board so Chambers I, I is the only place. suggest going elsewhere. Yeah, the Board Chambers is the only place where we had consistent um, virtual attendance. And there's plenty of parking. Plenty of parking. I think it's a great, it's a great I think place. this particular setup of meeting, though, um, I'm having difficulty sort of envisioning how it will be hybrid because we're going to be looking at paper maps. Um, but we could probably still Zoom it so that we could get input um, through Zoom. Yeah, we could, I'm sure we could figure something out. All right, so I'm leaning towards board chambers. I'm also okay. pro board chambers. I just wanted Excellent. to also throw out that Elks Lodge is also in North Lakeport, and I think people forget oh, yeah. about that. <laughs> we yeah. do forget about that. I, I yeah. forget about that. Thank I you. I mean, it's a community center. I was thinking about it this whole time, and it right. was just, you know, right. one of those things. True. Okay. Uh, I, I'm all for that idea, okay. Danny. Let's go there. The Elks Lodge? Or the, is that what it is? Yeah, yeah. Yes. So, I can take a look lodge. into it. If they host me for free, then that's great. I'm all about free. <laughs> I know I can get board chambers for free. So, well, yeah, okay. Cornelia, if you have, or Danny, if you have a contact for that, send it to me and I'll take a look this week. Excellent. Second, last thing, homework. Our next virtual meeting is going to center around policy from the existing local area plan that we still think is relevant or is obsolete and should be discarded. So at the Lake County 2050, you can find the um, a link to the Lakeport area plan or you can just Google Lakeport area plan uh, county you know, County of Lake California, and it'll take you straight to the planning documents page on our county website. If you could scroll through the Lakeport area plan, paying attention to the, um, so the, the chunks that are sort of at the end of the elements that have the priorities, goals, objectives, and implementation plans, we're going to go over that at our next virtual meeting to see what we should keep and what we should throw out. And that is all I have for you. Anybody have anything else before we adjourn for today? I'd like to recommend that you read the economic development and community development sections that are at the end of the policies and goals before you think about those policies and goals because that sets the whole stage for what created those policies and goals. It's very valuable information, really great um, uh, text. And Betsy, is that in the Lakeport area plan? Is that what yes. you're referring to? Yes. Okay, cool. Yeah, two, two sections. Good, good. Very, very helpful information. All right. I think that's going to close can we, up. Yep, can, uh, can, can, we, can we try to uh, sync the Lake County 2050 website with the calendar on the 2050 website to have the accurate meeting information? 
Um, Because like the upcoming Shoreline meeting and Middletown meeting, there's no meeting info on the the 2050 website on the calendar. It shows the, when you click on it, there's no agenda, no links, no nothing. So if we can sync those, that'd be great. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I just noticed that the in-person meetings weren't up on the Lake County 2050. So I have been communicating with core staff today to get that done. So I'll I'll just make sure that they've got an up-to-date thing. And... Yeah, Ruby yeah, has to make one the, the one agendas of, before we get them linked. But yeah, we'll get we'll get we'll work on that tomorrow. When yeah, everybody's I know back one, of the the email, one of the emails went out and it had the time slot as ten thirty, and then on the Lake County twenty fifty website it says ten o'clock. So they just don't sync. Thank you. We will double check all of those because that is a very good point. Maria, one question. Yeah. Can everybody meet at the same time next Monday? Oh, um, actually, I don't know about that. I'm going to use the doodle poll. So if you haven't, um, LAPAC members, I'm going to send you out that doodle poll again. And uh, tomorrow, start working on scheduling the next uh, virtual meetings. We lost Jared, but he. Um, I, I kind of want to move the meetings around a little bit, Greg, just so people who couldn't come at this kind of a time uh, could go the next time. Plus, on Monday, actually, I've got the Cannabis Ordinance Task Force, so um, you'll have no staff support. Yeah, he's having so, computer challenges, right? Yeah, yeah. So um, if you haven't yet, please fill out the doodle poll. We lost Jared. So, Greg, if you can reach out to Jared and have him complete that doodle poll, I'll be looking for your responses tomorrow for scheduling our next virtual and our in-person meeting. Thanks, everybody. This was good. Got good stuff here. Thank you so much. We'll see you next time.